live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone, live here at VMworld 2017, live CUBE coverage, third day of three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage, two sets here in the Broadcast Center with theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante, we're here with Pat Gelsinger, CEO of VMware. Pat, great to see you, smiling. I know you had a little, little bug, flu, or something going on, but you delivered a great performance on stage, oh, thank and congratulations. You. Thank you, thank you, Dave, and great to see you. Awesome <laughs> to be here, Pat, thank you. <laughs> it is so, <laughs> thanks, John, and you know, and I, we have this little inside joke here where, right, uh, Dave stood me up a few times, but he made it here today, so I'm thrilled. I'm yeah, back I, on the cube. I was this on the great. wire, I know, yeah. but I'm back, right? <laughs> He's on the bandwagon, <laughs> numbers are up, looking good, yeah, tangible yeah, performance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> John, good to see you. Hey, um, Great job as CEO of VMware, obviously with the Dell Technologies, a lot Thank of you. things going on last year. You commented here on theCUBE, what a personal struggle it's been for you on the professional and business side last year. Um, stocks at an all-time high, five years. Um, financially, VMware's doing great. Everyone's pumping, the message is clear, and you know, you, could, you look at the keynotes, a couple things that jump out at, at us when we look at all these events is, by the wave slide, when you position the wave slide, you can see who's got the waves down, and you're a, a wave guy, you've seen many waves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Your wave slide was very clean. Cloud, IoT Edge, very clean. VMware's made some decisions, made some bets, changed some bets that kind of weren't happening. Yep, Those yep. were a big point in VMware's history under your tutelage. Talk about the bets you made, what's panning out, obviously the clarity with the channel and the ecosystem and the, the communities there. What were the big bets, Pat, and mm -hmm. why is VMware doing so well right now? Yeah, and I, I sort of go back, uh, you know, it's been five years now. Uh, in fact, VMworld sort of marks my anniversary. You know, it was a stage uh, five years ago when I took over as CEO. And you know, soon after becoming uh, the CEO, I and the leadership team sort of got together and we said, hey, we need the focus. And we laid out our three-part strategy. One was around the private cloud, you know, do the whole SDDC. The second was what we called the hybrid cloud at the, uh, at the time. You know, we needed to figure out a way to you know, enable public and private resources together. And third was a UC. And sort of each one of those, if we just click a bit deeper into it, and that's DDC, obviously the NSX move, we had just acquired NYSERA. You know, we had launched the vSAN project. It was just a little seedling R&D project. Uh, we uh, brought together vRealize, which was sort of a collection of parts in the management space. But we really solidified that SDDC, and now all legs of it are performing. You sort of say, check, right? We are virtualizing the data center, we're no longer virtualizing compute. You know, second, on the cloud, obviously our first, you know, vCloud Air, the way the market went and so on, we had to do some adjustments there, but now when you think about how, you know, we said, you know, build private clouds, right, embrace public clouds, right, give consistent operations across any cloud. This is all planning out. The VMware partnership with Amazon, delivering on that. The VMware cloud services, people are excited about that. And in many respects, people say, wow, you got the IBM partnership, the Amazon uh, partnership, you got 4,400 cloud provider partners as well, and uh, what you've done for the cloud service. Wow, in some ways, maybe you have the most comprehensive strategy to the cloud now. And then in the end user computing space, it was really, you know, we were always sort of this perpetual number two to Citrix. And it was sort of like, are you guys like even trying in that space? And we said, hey, if we're going to be in the space, we have to be in mobility. We did the AirWatch acquisition, you know, and now those pieces that fit together with Workspace ONE and that's performing. So you look at every piece of what we're doing, you sort of say, ah, you're executing. And then maybe we put a cherry on the top with the security strategy. Yeah. You know, as we've done with micro segmentation, a single sign on, and now app defense, you know, and those are things that are really, that's the core of what we're doing and it, all of them are delivering. Well, I was at, in New York City shortly after you took this, this position and you laid out for the financial analysts sort of your view of the total available market, the segmentation, yep. you know, you did yep. your homework and a lot of those are coming true. Now, two and a half years in, license revenue was down. It was, you know, there looked to be a little, some bumps in the road. Today, 
let's review the numbers. I mean, license growth of what, 13%? 14%, less, less percent. Than 14%, you know, revenue was 12%, license revenue or, uh, was 14%, overall uh, bo uh, license bookings was uh, 14, overall uh, bookings 18%, 22% EPS growth, those are pretty good free numbers. cash flow of almost $3 billion. $3 billion right? is what and, we said, and, not and, almost, $3 and, billion. Just and, and, the, and, <laughs> those, okay, and, and, then, <laughs> and then, nice, and then uh, a very capital efficient business model. Yes, um, yeah. So all things are pointing to great tailwinds for you guys. To what do you attribute Attribute that. What are the forces? Was it, and, and how did the, you know, clarity around your cloud strategy fit into that? And also the reality of customers that you can't bring your business and reform it to the cloud. That you've got to bring the cloud to your data. I wonder if you could mm -hmm. talk about those tailwinds. Sure. And as we go think about all of those pieces, I mean, obviously our strategy now is resonating with customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a couple of years ago it was, you know, discussions like OpenStack and hey, everything's going to be in the public cloud. You guys are dead. Right, and now people realize, oh, you can't just refactor your applications to the public cloud, that's hard. And when you've moved, you haven't gotten any value from that. VMware gives you now the seamless way to do it. You know, we stitched together that whole uh, strategy and people say, oh, that works. New capabilities are the virtual networking. It's like, wow, that really changes how we think about the entire networking space. So one, the strategy is resonating uh, to customers broadly. Also, we've clearly seen that our own execution is just picking up momentum. Mm -hmm. you know, our sales teams, as we said, very balanced performance across all the geos, you know, every aspect of how we're building our partner relationships, et cetera. You know, and those are things that just take a, lot, take a long time to build. Right, it's easy to talk about sales execution, it just takes time to get those uh, capabilities in place. Uh, and uh, you know, continued great performance uh, by our partner community as well, very visible here. And then the Dell deal is working for us. You know, initially it drove us into the doldrums, you know, $43 a share, right? And now it's delivering real acceleration to our business. We've come through the other side, you know, a real respect of the ecosystem plus the acceleration from Dell. So everything really feels good. Yeah, things are pumping. It's awesome, congratulations. But let's get back to the bets I want to get to, because by the way, NSX I want to get to in a second, because that's going to be another power engine. You mentioned it last year, but let's get that in a second. The bets that we see right now at this show that was the big announcements were obviously Andy Jass, he was on stage, you yeah. guys shipped a general availability of uh, VMware on AWS, which was part of the announcement we covered in the spring mm -hmm. when in, in San Francisco. So you shipped it, so, which was big because on the heels of vCloud Air, you needed to get that win, and you yep. got the win. And then Andy came out and talked to all your customers, hey ops guys, we got your back, this is a real deal. That's pretty good for the customers. Then you got Google on here with this kind of Kubernetes, inside baseball, long game, strategic intent around mm -hmm. containers as a service, making things easier, shows another hand to the customers. You got some headroom. So you got operational support now with the cloud with Amazon, Google participating with Pivotal. Nice bet. Explain why those are two important bets. Yeah, and I'll actually say there's three important bets. But you know, obviously, you know, the first one is number one public with the number one private. Boom, they come together, customers go, wow. And this is an elegant solution. You know, that's the thing I always say to customers, can you run vSphere, right? All right? We got millions of people who can say yes to that. You can now use VMware and AWS. It's really that simple. You saw it demonstrated as well. And the elegance, the simplicity of that, oh, I can now add nodes to my cluster and I can now move workloads to it. Uh, it's just, okay, good. You're now taking advantage of the cloud. And the power of that with you know, literally 60 million workloads running that now have that kind of flexibility, you know, every CIO now has a massive new capability in his toolbox to set his IaaS strategy for the future. Game changing. You know, clearly the Google Pivotal announcement was you know, very much aimed toward that future developer, you know, the container development. You know, I'm one of the cool kids right, you know, who's doing microservices and scale out, but clearly bringing together the DevOps community with the infrastructure and operations, nobody's effectively bridging that gap today. And that's exactly where we're stepping into the middle with PKS, bringing all of the VMware stack up and bringing the developer friendly environment down very powerful, and to have Google here with us was a big right, uh, affirmation of that strategy. And the other one I'd say is the IBM partnership. 
you know, this is the big of the big, right? In the center of, you know, their installed base, the, you know, the customers who are on them today, plus they're also, you know, we had them there for the services. You might see them again in an event in the near future in a more prominent way as well. And that's also working for us. And then the other 4,399 cloud partners. So all of those taken together, very comprehensive. And then of course you lay, right, the icing on the cake, which is the VMware Cloud Services. Can you help us understand the sort of architectural evolution and the implications of, of cloud? Obviously VMware did a great job of dealing with the performance issues related to the abstraction layer and servers. Okay, the compute piece, check. Storage with flash, you know, used to be the problem. Now it's less and less the bottleneck and people talk about, okay, the network is now the next mm -hmm. bottleneck. And as you think about multi-cloud and binding those clouds, if you will, can you talk about architecturally how you're evolving, how VMware is evolving and what the architectural challenges are and sort of lay out what that looks like in the future. Yeah, and clearly, you know, I always like to say and uh, uh, the data has gravity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, compute is now getting pretty easy to move around, right? The data has gravity. It's pretty heavy to move around. You know, we can use age old uh, computer science tricks like caching, you know, but ultimately, mm, you know, these you know, petabytes of data starts to get to be very heavy. Uh, and then obviously the network is how you connect those things together. So we can apply more, we have more and more flexibility to move the compute to the data wherever it is uh, in the future. So clearly, you know, as we're thinking about multi-cloud and hybrid cloud, it's to make it easier and easier you know, for people to say, this is where I'm going to put my data for the following reasons. You know, and the following reasons may be, hey, I want it to be cheap, available globally in the cloud, so I'm going to pick a cloud provider, you know, a Google, Amazon, IBM, you know, doesn't matter. Or, I'm going to put it in this environment because I have to have, you know, this network of people working on it. Or for governance reasons, or privacy or others, I need to put it here. And now we can make it very easy to bring compute to that, or even, you know, as we think even further out in time, not just compute or containers, but also functions and serverless uh, as well. And obviously solving network uh, bottlenecks underneath that, you know, make the network easier and easier. And uh, with NSX, obviously, as we keep expanding that platform of capabilities, you know, we have to make all of the network functions easily consumable, right, at that software layer now. So you're going to see more and more of routing functions and load balancer functions, obviously with micro-segmentation firewall functions moving into that layer, more intelligence, because we're going to be able to say, wow, if I move that piece of workload relying on this data, oh, that's a pretty bad move. You know, you have to start having uh, much more, right, uh, affinity-based the uh, allocation of where things move as well. So that ends up being intelligence in the management plane as well, combining with that agility that we're building in the networking layer. And you know, a lot of cases, if you think even further out in time, you know, it's going to be, what's all this edge computing? Because now you're going to have all these devices creating extraordinary amounts of computing capacity at the edge. So that's where some of the technologies like SD-WAN start to become relevant to play as well. And NSX becomes this way that we can reach even further right, and closer and other factors, particularly as we start thinking about edge and IoT use cases, where it won't be about data gravity, it'll be about latency issues of delivered value to the robot or you know, to the car to swerve or whatever it might be. It's interesting with the data and the software eating the world, data eating software, as we say in theCUBE, you have, you guys as an infrastructure provider, looking like a SaaS company. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. So more and more software and data are driving everything. So the question is, is this going to be a VMware inside the cloud campaign coming? I mean, <laughs> if we see some patterns here, Pat. You know, uh, what? You know, uh, you know, I may be able to reuse some of that Intel inside uh, marketing uh, yeah. <laughs> programs. Yeah. That is Robin, but that is, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. like that on the back. But, but this is what we're yeah, seeing. Yeah, Robin doesn't let me in the marketing department, just a little bit. <laughs> Pat, we have a few ideas we need to test. Okay, good, now leave, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I commented on this one, like last spring, which, oh, VMware capitulated in, in these cloud deals, but here's what's interesting. As the clouds start to emerge in these specialty clouds, I call them, I don't call them tier two, but a second level of clouds. Yep. The native guys, not cloud native, but like Amazon, Google, Microsoft, will always have that native cloud position, but now a new set of functionalities emerging, mm -hmm. call it cloud service providers on steroids or next generation cloud service providers, they're going to need a supplier. Right, VMware is perfectly aligned now to come in to power that, so you can argue that VMware now never capitulated. They have 5,000 plus customers. They're not going anywhere yet. 
and, or there's more opportunity. So talk about this new dynamic, mm -hmm. the power of the customer base, yeah. and how it fits in this new cloud dynamic where new clouds will emerge on top of these native clouds. Yeah, and you know, a, a couple of just like little data points to help that and then talk about it more broadly. You know, clearly, I mean, your customers, you, I, had a, I had a big burly federal customer I was meeting with, and you know, I was a little bit afraid to say no to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says, you know, I tried to re-platform to the native cloud services, and I couldn't get it done. Yeah. Right, it was hard, it was heavy, so you know, the idea of VMware Cloud being able to now take him to the cloud in a seamless way, wow, that was powerful uh, to him. You know, another little data point. Uh, when we had the first rumors of our AWS partnership came out, one of the first phone calls I got was from a, another cloud provider and says, I want to be your first partner for that. And I'm like, don't you compete with Amazon? Right, and, and you know, I, I mean, I was really sort of taken back. And he says, no, no, no. He says, you know, we realize that we can't compete with them, we have to add value with them. And yeah, we have our specialized cloud services that we offer. You know, we're reselling Amazon Cloud already, and your service combined with what we're already doing, it was one of our VCAN partners, now our VMware Cloud Provider partners, was adding this service that you're doing. Can we resell that as well? How can we be the lead partner for that as well? So very much that partner community for us is very much, you know, some of them will be quote specialized clouds, but many of them will be, you know, I'm the point of the customer relationship now. You know, I have all of these workloads, many of them built on VMware, I have these other service offerings, you know, because I want to own and take care of that customer for life. Relationships there. Absolutely. They own it. Absolutely. And you know, and you know, if you're rack space, you're going to call that fanatical service. If you're IBM, you're going to call that vertical industry competence and you know, so on. You know, and those relationships now are the center and now they're saying that this is other compute capabilities or service capabilities. I'm the one who are going to deliver and in many cases those are going to be specialized clouds as well. You know, to me, I, find, I find it stunning that many of my traditional enterprise customers, they're becoming service providers. You know, they're, and essentially their customers or their internal departments are essentially becoming their tenants in a multi-tenant well, cloud this way. Changes the nature of the relationship the customer has with their vendor. Indeed, Because now indeed. it's not a procurement, it's a relationship piece. The cloud's working together, it's changing the, the work relationship. Absolutely, Can you Absolutely. elaborate on some of those dynamics because you're going to have Amazon, you guys have been successful so far mm -hmm. in working that relationship for both parties. Yeah, and you know, clearly as, you know, as we look to the future here as well, you know, I mean, it's very, <laughs> you know, you know we, we have to, we're, we're learning how to partner with all of them and present a value proposition, and, and ultimately, you know, as, as I describe it, if you do what the customer wants, almost always you're going to do okay, right? You know, oh, is that competitively better or worse, and what happens here, and so on like that. You know, keep your eye on the customer, do things that add value to the customer, and things will work out okay in the long term. So Pat, uh, four years ago on theCUBE, we asked you, is security a do-over? And you were pretty unequivocal about that. You said, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely is. <laughs> and then uh, Monday on stage you said, as an industry, we've failed you. Now, it's not for the lack of trying, it's not for the lack of funding. Mm -hmm. What is it and why is it changing? And how yeah. will it change? Yeah, and I think, you know, if you think about that section of my keynote on Monday, you know, I tried to lay out, you know, I'll say a pretty declarative view of what we think is a fundamental restructuring of the industry, where you know, we need to melt many of the security functions into the infrastructure. Not make it that you turn them on, it's like, it's hard to turn them off, right? You know, and right, unless you do something, you can't not be multi-factor and single sign-on. You know, your data is going to be encrypted, right? Unless you like figure out that you really, really need it turned off, right? You're going to be micro-segmented unless you, you know, specifically, you know, force it not to. You know, it's like make all those things so standardized and so integrated, right? Because right now the problem is you got these almost 2,000 vendors, so many point solutions, and you, Mr. CIO, in a mobile cloud world where you own and control almost nothing, you got 2,000 things to stitch together. You got to test them, manage them, make sure they're updated and managed. 
it's hopeless, right? And then you got attackers who basically are finding and weaseling their way around all the edge use cases for any of those individual products. It's a very broken view of delivering a security model for our customers. So we laid it out, the three things, secure the infrastructure, we're going to do a whole lot of that, melt these core functions, integrated ecosystem, prove those use cases, contextual management integration, you know, packet flows, all that kind of stuff. We have to do that with our core partners, right, for and then enable consistent cyber hygiene. You know, five things we said, least privilege, you know, data encryption, multi-factor uh, authentication, um, oh, one slip of my mind, right? Software patching and, and uh, updating uh, and micro-segmentation. studying up for all that. Look at, look at you, <laughs> CEO, good to see. response was <laughs> the other one. Response was the other big piece of the yeah. strategy. And, yeah, and you know, for this, you know, we really think that, uh, and if you look at all the major breaches, you know, we think 80 plus percent of them would be eliminated or the attack surface so dramatically reduced if you just did cyber hygiene well. And like I said on stage, you know, it's like a sports team. You know, you don't, you, you don't need to practice the complex plays very often. Almost all your practice time is on the basics, yeah. right? You do those really, really well on a consistent basis. You know, you don't have many problems. Pat, final question. I know the handlers are, are they're yelling at us across the way. Oh, you got to go. Um, <laughs> final question. Um, okay, let's hang out for a while. <laughs> hey, <laughs> CEO, you can do whatever you want. The CEO, you, look, you got a good, good stock price right now. You can do whatever you want. No, uh, we all know what the cloud looks like today. Amazon and the configuration and the customers can get that and they see a path, they understand hybrid, they understand the cloud, they see the picture, they mm -hmm. see the trajectory. My question for you is, what is the expectation of the customer and the experience of the cloud in 2022? Because now you can shoot the arrow forward. What is your vision for that expectation of the customer and the experience that they're going to have? Yeah, and let me suggest maybe three different dimensions for that. One might surprise you a little bit. Um, you know, but one is, you know, I mean, you know, if we do our job over the next couple of years, you're simply going to be able to say, you know, and Michael likes to say this, you know, cloud is a model, right, it's not a place. Right, and we're going to be able to say, hey, we're going to make a set of services uh, uh, ubiquitously available, they might be on premise for business needs, they might be in the cloud, across multiple clouds. You're going to be able to say, you know, I have an, I have an IaaS environment that's globally available and infinitely scalable. You just say, and you know, it's just, yeah. it just works. Sounds good, yeah. Right, you know, and has security built into it, I'm able to connect to it at all of these places, I'm able to stretch it to the edge. You know, it's just phenomenal in that way. Second piece as you think about that cloud is, is now, now that we've really sort of addressed that, now you're going to, in many cases, your cloud is really going to be based on the services that it uniquely offers over and above that capability. And you might say, oh, you know, I'm really excited about that new machine learning breakthrough that Google did. And you're going to say, oh, most of my workloads, I, I have this flexibility, VMware's given that to me, but that's exciting, because I'm, you know, let me see how I can use that for my business advantage. Oh, you know, Watson came out with it, let me take advantage of that. Uh, you know, and uh, boy, you know, that serviceless stuff that, uh, you know, and Lambda, that's pretty cool, I'm excited about that. And you're going to be able to start saying, you know, against this fabric of flexibility, global availability, scalability, right, you know, I'm going to be able to take advantage of those. Other services are clearly going to be ensuring that I'm secure, that I'm meeting my regular regulatory requirements and you know, the governance capabilities that I have associated with it. So you know, that, that's really what the differentiator is going to be five years from now. You know, it's going to be the services over and above those uh, capabilities. You know, but the other thing that we, we foresee happening is um, that uh, you know, 5G starts getting built out at the end of this decade. 5G will be potentially the largest capital build out of the remainder of our careers. You know, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, you know, we're healthy, young, <laughs> you know, so like I, you know, you know, but over the next 20 years, this is the big kahuna, right? You know, yeah. building a 5G networks, probably 10X the number of antennas are going to get installed, you know, 100X the bandwidth, new spectrum allocations, and 100X the new devices that are going to get connected to it as well. And how the 5G networks can interconnect with that cloud to deliver services, because all of a sudden I may have a whole, you know, I have a, may have a VR, AR use case that needs a thousand X the bandwidth, and then all of a sudden I may be trying to reach to, you know, a thousand X the number of edge devices, and we're going to have these enormous interconnected yeah. cloud services. You know, and as we think about that, and that's why we sort of, you know, added that telco piece to the vision of, uh, you know, VMware that we uh, presented on Monday of this uh, week, and that's why for us, you know, as we're starting to reach yeah. into the NFV space, the Vodafone 
iPhone announcement that we uh, did this week and you know, some of the edge and IoT things that we're doing. We're quite excited that that starts opening up. You know, and, and again, it's not going to happen in the next year or two at significance, but five years from now, this is a big deal for These us the big as an industry. Big, that's a big wave. Get out in front of that wave. If you're not out in front of that wave, you're driftwood. Someone once said on the cube, oh, that was you. <laughs> <laughs> um, final question. This is only going to take 20 minutes to answer, but um, I noticed there's a soft side of Pat Gelsinger this year. Hugs on stage. Oh my gosh. Do we what get hugs this? now uh, on theCUBE? Uh, right, before you know. we finish here, I'm going to give you both a hug. You know, <laughs> right, you get a hug for consistency. You know, he gets a, you know, he was a. Uh, lost child uh, came yeah, back. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give him the know, Forgive the prodigal, Joseph. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the prodigal has returned, I love you. Matt Gelsinger, uh, well. CEO, he's got a spring to his step, he's got some smiles, stocks up on the right, financials looking great, products are looking great, customers are happy, great roadmap, big waves coming. Pat, thanks for sharing your insight. And commentary. Always a pleasure to be in the and thank you thank for you your guys. support over the years. Been great guests. Very good. Thank you very much. More live yeah, coverage to be back. after this short break. <laughs>